Hey everyone. So the Civil War had a huge impact on the development of the United States in the second half of the 20th century. Today we are going to talk about the ways in which the war and Reconstruction, which occurred after, shaped the economy. In the years following the Civil War, the economy of the United States would go through a dramatic transformation known as the Second Industrial Revolution. The Second Industrial Revolution would shift America from an agricultural society to one that was fully industrialized. The Civil War was the catalyst for much of this industrialization. It can be viewed as an economic turning point in our nation's history. So mobilizing for the Civil War was a massive undertaking that in many ways stimulated the Northern economy. The North had a significant economic advantage at the start of the Civil War. Not only did the North control most of the nation's wealth, but they also had a larger population, thousands of more miles of railroad track, and significantly more manufacturing. After the first shots at Fort Sumter, the North began to bring these financial resources to bear against the Confederacy. With the Southern states no longer in the Union, Northern Republicans in Congress were able to pass a number of new laws that were designed to stimulate industry and help finance the war. The first law was the Morrill Tariff Act, which increased tariff rates to protect American industry and raise funds for the war effort. Additionally, the government established a new national banking system to finance the war. The National Banking Act helped to pay for the war by selling bonds and establishing a standard paper currency throughout the North. More importantly, though, the national banking system was the most important banking legislation passed by the federal government since the second national bank in the 1830s. The creation of a national banking system would provide a financial infrastructure that was heavily needed uh, in order to grow big businesses after the war. The Civil War significantly improved the infrastructure in the North by expanding the railroad system as well. In, the 18, in 1861, the North had about 22,000 miles of railroad tracks. These railroads played a pivotal role in the victory of the Northern armies during the Civil War. The railroad allowed the North to quickly transport goods, artillery, and men, and it helped the Union uh, strategically deploy their resources against the South. For a nation that was torn apart by war, many Northerners saw railroads as a way of tying the nation together. Republicans in Congress pursued this policy of unification through railroads by passing the Pacific Railway Act in 1862. The Pacific Railway Act helped fund the building of a transcontinental railroad to help link the East and the West. The government funded the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad by using land grants to railroad companies. And by 1869, the project was completed. This feat would help the North and the West link together, making valuable Western resources available to help stimulate the economy and industrial production. The northern economy also benefited, benefited from increased agricultural production in the West during the Civil War. The Civil War demanded massive food production to feed the Union Army. Over 250,000 mechanical reapers helped turn farmlands in the North and West into commercial agricultural producers. The corn and wheat fields of the North were able to produce so much surplus grain that by the end of the war, northern agricultural products overtook King Cotton as a major export. To further stimulate Western settlement and the expansion of farming on the Great Plains, the, we the federal government passed the Homestead Act in 1862. The Homestead Act gave settlers 160 acres of land out West for little to no money, and it promoted westward migration and the development of the farming frontier in the years following the Civil War. Factory production also increased for the North during the Civil War. Northern factories introduced new labor-saving machinery, which allowed them to increase production even as many workers were called off to fight. For example, the North was able to fabricate a large number of uniforms and shoes for the Army with the help of the sewing machine. Isaac uh, Singer patented his sewing machine in 1850, and by 1863, at the height of the Civil War, Singer was selling 20,000 sewing machines each year. All of these changes increased the prosperity of the North. By 1870, the North controlled 88% of the nation's wealth. The Civil War gave birth to the first millionaire class in American history. These individuals would dominate the American economy in the years following the Civil War. Of course, if the Civil War improved the fortunes of the North, it also had the opposite effect on the South. Prior to the Civil War, the Southern economy had been built on King Cotton, which was the single largest American export before the war had begun. The South had felt that King Cotton would help them win the war, and they were hoping Great Britain's reliance on cotton for their textile mills would persuade them to provide aid to the Confederacy. However, King Cotton failed them. Part of the reason for this was that the South was a victim of their own success. 
The South had produced so much cotton in the 1850s that European countries like Great Britain had large cotton surpluses stored in their warehouses. By the time Great Britain's cotton supply began to dwindle, they were able to find new suppliers such as Egypt and India. Cotton was never again to drive the American economy. The Civil War had replaced cotton capitalism with industrial capitalism. The South had other issues at the end of the Civil War as well. Most of the fighting of the Civil War had occurred in the South and had left large parts of the South completely destroyed. Rebuilding the South became one of the major goals of Reconstruction. However, by far the most pressing issue involved the four million slaves who had been freed by the war. How would these slaves be integrated into the economy given the very nature of the institution of slavery, which had denied them education, land, and personal savings? At first, it looked like the North was going to take steps to issue former slaves land so that they could achieve economic independence. During the Civil War, General Sherman issued Special Field Order 15 in January of 1865, which set aside large tracts of land in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. The federal government had confiscated over 400,000 acres of land from Southerners during the actual war. The government began to distribute this land to former slaves. Each former slave was given 40 acres, and over 40,000 slaves took advantage of this opportunity. The military leader decreed that the army would lend many of these new settlers mules, which gave rise to the famous slogan that former slaves were promised 40 acres and a mule. Sherman's policy was reinforced by the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau in March of 1865. The Freedmen's Bureau, under the leadership of Oliver Howard, rented out land to former slaves with the intent that they would be able to buy that land within three years. However, the redistribution of Confederate lands to former slaves soon ran into trouble in the form of President Andrew Johnson. So Andrew Johnson was a very lenient when it came to his reconstruction plan for the South which granted amnesty to many former Confederates. Johnson personally pardoned many of the top officials of the Confederacy, as well as some of the wealthiest Southern plantation owners. These pardons reestablished the rights of former Confederates. And in September of 1865, President Johnson ordered Oliver Howard and the Freedmen's Bureau to give back all the land to its original owners. This had a devastating effect on the Freedmen. Howard was forced to take back the lands that had been distributed by the federal government, leaving many freedmen with very few economic opportunities. This represented the single greatest failure of the federal government during Reconstruction, because the government never seriously addressed the economic needs of former slaves. With no land, many freed slaves found themselves ensnared in an economic system that in many ways looked remarkably similar to slavery, sharecropping. Lacking savings and formal education, many freedmen became tenant farmers, working someone else's land. Sharecropping forced both white and black farmers to rent land and housing from a landowner. They would sign sharecropping contracts, which paid the landowner about one half to one third of their crops. The landowners would set the prices of the harvest, as well as loan the sharecroppers tools and seeds, with interest, of course. So the combination of these loans, coupled with the falling prices of cotton after the Civil War, ensured that sharecroppers were constantly in debt and essentially became tied to someone else's land. This cycle of poverty would greatly limit the economic opportunities for African Americans in the years following the Civil War. For many African Americans in the South, education was the key to improving their economic position. The Freedmen's Bureau had successfully opened up public schools and communities across the South during Reconstruction, and it is responsible for teaching roughly 200,000 African Americans how to read and write. Several black colleges were formed throughout this period as well, including Howard University and Fisk University. However, by far the most famous school created during this time period was the T Tuskegee Institute, founded in 1881. The Tuskegee Institute was led by black civil rights leader Booker T. Washington and was an important vocational school that specialized in teaching students agricultural and industrial skills. Booker T. Washington viewed vocational skills and economic independence as the most important steps towards racial equality in the United States and the best way for African Americans to fight back against the rise of Jim Crow laws in the South following the end of Reconstruction. The, the Tuskegee Institute was instrumental in training teachers to work in rural areas areas of the South, greatly expanding access to education for many African Americans. So the era of Reconstruction reshaped all parts of the Southern economy, just like it did the North. As Northern armies left the South after 1877, a new South emerged, which was economically more diverse than the old Cotton Kingdom. 
Journalists such as Henry Grady promoted this idea of a new South in order to attract new businesses and investors to the region. Indeed, economic progress had been made by the South in the years following the Civil War. As the North shifted their industrial production to heavy industries such as steel and oil, the South began to industrialize more as well. And Southern factories took the place of New England as the center of textile production in the United States. Additionally, the South improved its infrastructure by rapidly expanding their railroad network in the years following the war. On the whole, however, the South remained largely agricultural and tied to the production of cotton. The South after the Civil War was by far the poorest section of the American economy, with an average Southerner earning about two-fifths of their Northern counterparts. The continued reliance on sharecropping would keep both black and white farmers in a state of perpetual poverty, and the growth of Jim Crow laws would continue to limit economic opportunities for African Americans. These issues would continue to shape American life well into the 20th century. Take care.